Hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca Winter, like Rabbi Common said. It's a pleasure to be here, and I will be talking briefly today about Batsheva Root and the elusive Eshet Chayil. Um, and we're going to start off by talking about Eshet Chayil, and hopefully through this discussion, we will start to understand or maybe glean some important and I think interesting messages about how the Eshet Chayil can and might relate to Megillat Root, which is, of course, the Megillah that we will be reading in about a week and a half on Shavuot. Uh, so let's let's jump in. Um, so Sefer Mishle is one of our one of our less known books in the Tanakh. It is a little bit esoteric. Not many people know so much about Mishle, myself included. It's definitely attributed to be written by Shlomo Hamelech. Shlomo, of course, the son of Dabi. Um, and it says so right at the beginning, Mishle Shlomo ben David, Melech Israel. These are the proverbs of Shlomo, the son of David, the king of Israel. And he tells us right away, Shlomo, um, the purpose of Sefer Mishle is Ladat Chochma Umusar Lahavin Imre Bina, that it's about learning wisdom and discipline, understanding important words. So basically, it's about how to lead your life wisely, we could say. Um, and even though maybe I know myself included, we're not so familiar with much of Mishle overall. It spans 31 Prakim, I believe. Um, we are familiar with some phrases from Mishle, and I put them over here for you. We're, of course, referring, we think, to the Torah, that it is the tree of life. Shema b'ni musara vicha that you should listen to your father, to the Musar of your father, Valti Tosh Tarati Mecha. So there are some phrases that we're familiar with. Um, and specifically, the um, poem, I think, that we're most familiar with that comes from Mishle is the Eshet Chayel. And Eshet Chayel is, I think most people, many people, at least many households, sing this as a song every week on Friday night. Um, praising the women of the house or the wife, the mother of the house, grandmother. Um, and it comes from the last parak in Mishle. Um, what's interesting, I think, is that Eshet Chayil really only starts about 10 psukim into the last parak of Mishle. Um, and it starts off with a fascinating and some, somewhat perplexing introduction. And so before we get into the Eshet Chayil and how it might relate to the two female protagonists I want to talk about today, about Sheva and Ruth, um, I do want to delve a little bit into this introduction about the Eshet Chayil. And it says the beginning of Perak Lamed Aleph of Perak 31, chapter 31 of Mishle says, Divrei Limuel Melech Masa Asher Yisratanu Yisratu Imo. These are the words of Lemuel, the king of Masa, with which his mother admonished him. And the parak essentially starts off by saying that these are words that this mother is criticizing a king with. And she goes on to say that this king is writing about the words that his mother uses. And it goes on to say, I'll read the English, no, my son, no, O son of the womb, no, O son of my vows, do not give your strength to women, your vigor to those who destroy kings. And she goes on, wine is not for kings, O Lemuel, not for kings to drink, not any drink for princes. So she goes on to warn him about different things that this woman may lead him astray about. Essentially, she's saying, in so many words, marry the right person. Um, marry someone who is not going to lead you astray, but is who go who's going to be the right person. And this entire lead up leads us to Pasukia, the 10th verse in Parak 31, which starts with the very famous Eshet Chayil Mim Sa Verachok Mipninim Mikra. Rather, you should, what, what a rarity it is to find this Eshet Chayil and she's the one who you should be with. Her worth is far beyond that of rubies. And then so goes the song that we sing, um, many of us at least sing every Friday night. And so I think most of us, and I, I, at least I didn't know until I did some research into this, that really this song, this Eshet Chayil, is preceded by this idea that it was actually written by a mother 
who's criticizing her son, who's admonishing the son, who's a king, saying, make sure you take the right wife, because that could really set the tone or set you up for success in your life. And many of the Parshanim try to figure out first, who is this Lemuel? Who is this man? Who are we talking about? We know all of Mishle was written by Shlomo. Why do we suddenly switch to this new king? The Gemara says, well, of course, we're still talking about Shlomo. And I brought a quote here from Vayikra Rabbah. Why is this king calling himself Lemuel? Why is it Divre Lemuel? Um, it says, El Lemelachim Lemuel, Amar Rav Yachanan, Ein Natsni Malchut Lemishem Aflig Al Dvarim Shel El. So it is um, basically we don't give monarchy to those who contradict the words of God, essentially saying that um, the mother is admonishing her, her son, the king, to follow Hashem and marry the right person. And she's saying that Lama El, do not be somebody who contradicts the word of Hashem. And that's why even in the name, this person is called Lemuel. And so it's not so much that there's this new king who is this, this random king whose mother is admonishing him, but rather this is Shlomo under this pet name, under this guise of Lama El, that he could become somebody who contradicts the word of Hashem if he goes down this path of not being with the correct woman. Which, of course, means that if it's true that Lemuel in Mishle is really still Hamelech Shlomo, then that means that the Eshet Chayel is attributed to or potentially written by none other than Shlomo's wife, who was, uh, excuse me, Shlomo's mother, who was Batsheva. Um, and so I would like to explore a little bit of Batsheva, who she was what her life was like and why she may have been the one to write the Aisha Kyle and why she wrote the Aisha Kyle in this way. Oops, all right. Hopefully you could still see me. Okay, there we go. There we go. So I, I'd like to just talk about Batshevash for just a minute. Um, Batsheva, Shlomo's mother, she came from a very well-connected family. According to Diver Hayamim, she was actually the granddaughter of Achitofel. Achitofel was one of David's top advisors until he abandons David um, very infamously. Um, she was also married to a war general named Uria. And of course, the very sad and tragic story goes that Batsheva was bathing on the roof one night. Her husband was at war fighting with um, Bnei Amon. David goes up to the roof and he sees her and he's overcome by desire. He takes her and they sleep together. And this results in a pregnancy. In order to cover up the pregnancy, uh, but she, um, David then goes and tries to have Uriah killed through different means. He manages to have Uriah killed on the battlefield. And the child that was conceived that night die shortly after his birth and they have a second child together david then marries batsheva and they have a second child together who is shlomo hamela um, now there's an interesting blog it's called what's shot written by rabbi alex magid i think that he magid maybe i think he's spoken for torah and motion before he's from toronto it's a it's a wonderful blog i think it's he's no longer posting regularly but it's worth reading to the for those who are interested and he points out that Many of the themes of the Batsheva story are, are actually very much rooted in the Parsha of Esha Yafat Toar, which is the Parsha that starts off the um, Parshat Kitetse and Dvarim. And he points out that, that the Esha Yafat Toar essentially is a woman who's taken in battle and a man is overcome by this desire in battle. And so he takes this woman and he takes her back to her to his home. And I brought the source for you here. And you, you start taking captives. You see a, a beautiful woman. And you take her back to your house. And there are laws associated with how to treat her. Interestingly, immediately following the parsha of Eshet Yifat Toar, 
we learn about the Isha Hasnua, a woman who we no long who a man may no longer love. And that starts here in Pasuk Yodalad. And then that very quickly moves into the laws of the Ben Sorero More, the wayward son, who maybe is um who is not following in the ways of Hashem. And many of the Parshanim try to understand what is the similarity between these three laws, the Esha Ifatoar, the uh, Isha Hasnua, and the Ben Sorero More. And they say, well, it makes sense that if you have a woman who you took in the middle of battle and who really you were just drawn by your most base desire, and that's what drew you to take this woman, you may eventually come to hate this woman, and then the product of this union will result in a child who understands his place in the household as being the product of a hated marriage, and he will become a wayward son, a ben sorero more, as a result of the, these terrible circumstances. And so one can imagine in, in terms of Bathsheba, it doesn't perfectly line up. She wasn't taken as a captive, but she was definitely taken within the context of, these, of the war. And so much of her life was really surrounded, was really led and influenced by this context of being taken as really like a prized wife through, through really within the context of battle. And so one can imagine how the children of Bathsheba actually would really be at risk to be these wayward children, these Ben Sorero More, which someone once pointed out when I was talking about this to someone, they said, you know, maybe that maybe that's one of the reasons why the child, that child had to die, essentially, that there was just so much, so much that was rotten about how the relationship came to be and that the child would never really be able to lead a successful life, which is a terrible thing to think. But even Shlomo himself was at risk really of becoming a, a Ben Sorero More. And, um, sorry. And really, I think this whole context, it's, it's unsurprising to us. There's so many different examples in the Tanakh of times when war and illicit or untoward sexual relationships really come together. One of the most famous examples that, that really ought that come to mind for me is at the very end of Sefer Shoftim, when we learn about the Pilegesh Bagiva, this, uh, this concubine wife who is horribly, I mean, led to being raped in Sheva Binyamin, which leads to an entire civil war. And at the very end of this civil war, when Sheva Binyamin no longer has women to marry, the conclusion of Bnei Israel at that time is that they'll let people let women go into the field, and the people of Binyamin would just snatch the women and take the women that they want. Again, through this like frenzy of war, there's also this emotional feeling of um, of just taking of taking women and this this lewdness, this these these relationships that come about in ways that. We don't really approve of, I would say, absolutely, um, in, in, in our Torah life. And I think that Batsheva does in many ways, as Rabbi Alex Maggi points out, he very much falls, uh, she very much falls under this category. And so, um, interestingly, throughout this whole episode of her being maybe within this, within this context of the Seisha Ifat Torah at the beginning of her life, she very much changes her path at the end of her life. And we could see that in uh, Sefer Malachim. Sorry, I didn't put the uh, the source up there. I'll add it in. This is Sefer Malachim Perak Aleph, starting at Pasuk uh, Tetvav. And Batsheva, at this point in her life, she's older. She already has a son, a grown-up son, Shlomo HaMelech. And at that time, when uh, David is about to die, one of his older sons, Adonia, decides that he wants to become king. And he comes to Batsheva and he essentially asks Batsheva for permission from her that she should go and ask the king on his behalf that Adonia would marry one of essentially David's concubines. We won't get into the, the full story. And Batsheva through this realizes that her son Shlomo is at risk of losing the Malucha. And she, be, she takes initiative. 
And she, through uh, Natan Hanavi, who's very close with David, she approaches David, So she approaches David Hamelach in his room, Batikod Batsheva, Vatomerla in Pasuk Yudzain, Adoni Atani Shbata Bahashem Lakecha, Lamatecha, Kishlomo Banecha Yimlacha Harecha. And she says, Listen, David, you promised me that Shlomo was going to be king. And she advocates on behalf of her family and herself and her son, Behu Yashev Al Kisi. And he would be the one to, to take over, not Adonia. And David actually listens to her. And he says, okay, yes, I, I hear what you're saying. I understand. And I, I and he gets rid of Adonia. And of course, we know that Shlomo becomes the next king of Israel. And so I think Batsheva's life, if we think about it, she really moves from this very passive position as she was initially taken, maybe um, in essence or in thematically as the Aisha Yifatar, a very passive woman, to really being the queen, to really having the ear of both Natan Hanavi, some of the king's closest advisors, as well as David Hamela. And that really, I think, uh, bookends Batsheva's life, that movement from being a very passive voice to being an advocate for herself, for her son, for her family. And so I think given that context of Batsheva's life, it's unsurprising that if we are to attribute the Eshet Chayil to her, that she's actually writing the Eshet Chayil using motifs of war. And there are many, many motifs of war and war-like words throughout the Aisha Chayel. Um, and I brought a few for you here, but you know, hopefully this, this Shabbos, while you're singing, you can also pay attention to more because there are many, many that come up. Of course, Aisha Chayel, um, we call it a woman of valor, but really Chayel is a warrior, right? It's a warrior woman. And Ish Chayel um, is someone who's a warrior. Um, we talk about that, she talks about, we, 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 we mention in the Eishe Chayel, Mahra, or price, which is very reminiscent of selling and buying of different slaves or even concubines, as we talked about with Eishe Yifatar. There's, we say, Shalal lo yachsar, that she doesn't have a lack of spoils. Chagra be'oz matneha, she girds her loins. I mean, these are very warlike motifs. Batach Bale Bala, her husband trusts her, which we know this word batach, betach is very much used in the context of war and peace. In this week's Parsha, for example, right before the Tochacha, we we have in um, this past week's Parsha and Parsha Bechukata, it said, Bishabtem al Haaretz la betach, that if you listen to Hashem, your enemies won't bother you because you will be in safety, you'll be in security. And it's used throughout the Tanakh as this foil almost to war. She strengthens her arms. And there are many, many more. I just brought a few. But really, there is this idea of this motif of war throughout the Eshet Chayel, which is, which is interesting if we think of the Eshet Chayel just in a silo without understanding the broader context. But I think for Batsheva, she really understood that a true Eshet Chayel was somebody who could use she's using these motifs of war to somehow strengthen her relationship and strengthen the marriage and many parshanim look at the Aisha Chayel and try to figure out not who wrote the Aisha Chayel but who is the subject of the Aisha Chayel who is the Aisha Chayel about and I think that I've seen some midrashim about how well this was actually written about Sarah Imenu and many of the characteristics of Sarah Imenu there's another parshan that I read that talked about how there are like 18 different women that the Eshet Chayel could be referring to. The Dat Mikra actually almost in passing, as the Dat Mikra often does, um, has a throwaway comment here in Mishle that quite obviously the Eshet Chayel is talking about Rut Hamoavia. The Eshet Chayel is clearly written about Rut. And um, actually, my brother-in-law, Rabbi Mordechai Torchiner, who many from Toronto are very familiar with, um, about 15 years ago or so, I think he gave a shiur about um, how he he saw this comment in the Dat Mikra, and he said, this is so interesting, how is the Aisha Chayel related to Root? And he said, you know what, Aisha Chayel fits Root's personality so well. There are so many themes in the Aisha Chayel 
that fit into Rude's personality. And he breaks down uh, some characteristics of Rude Hamavia. And he says that we know that Rude was very loyal. Of course, she was very loyal to Naomi. She's trustworthy. She's someone who Naomi was able to trust with, um, with many, I mean, Naomi came, um, you know, desperate. She had nothing. She was destitute when they traveled from the fields of Moab back to Eretz Israel. Um, but she trusts in Rude. Ruth eventually becomes very successful through her marriage to Boaz. She actually has physical strength when she's in the fields and she's picking up those big barrels of wheat, bringing them back to bringing them back to Naomi to feed them both, to feed them both, excuse me. And she really is an initiator. She initiates her way into becoming a Jewish person and she's very pious as she becomes um, as she decides to become a Jewish person, and as she decides to follow Hashem, which is ultimately why many people say we read Ruth on Shavuot, someone who took the initiative, somebody who decided on the by themselves to to follow in Hashem's ways, which I think is some is the theme really of Shavuot. And says Rabbi Torchiner that if we think about the definition of Chayil, who is a Chayil in the Tanakh? There are actually five different definitions of Chayel, which match up and line up beautifully with Root's personality. If we think about it, Root was trustworthy, and we have a pasuk, Bayomer Shlomo, this is also from Sefer Melachim, Imiye la ben Chayel. So if he, if this person has, is trustworthy, if he's a Chayel, la yipol misara ta'artza, then I won't kill him. Um, the Chayil may be also someone who care, who acquires wealth from Yirmiyahu, Chelcha, Ba'otzrotech alavazaten, right? That your, I'll give your Chayil, meaning I'll give your wealth and your storehouses to be despoiled. Um, Chayil, as we said, is a person of strength. Vatihi Yisrael, Shmona Me'od Elef, Ish Chayil, these are Anshe Chayil, physically strong people. Chayil is someone who takes initiative. Ba'achechem, Ish Chayil, Ba'kwach La'avda. Their brothers were Ishchayel with strength to work. This is in the Ibrah Yamim. People were called up and the, the Anshe Chayel who took initiative came. And Chayel is a person of piety. Um, as we know from Sefer Shmot, V'atat chazem mikol ha'am Anshe Chayel, Yireh Elohim, Anshe Amet v'sone Batza. This is talking about when Yitro is giving Moshe advice, what kind of people should be the um, the shotrim, which uh, shoftim, which kind of people should be judges of Ne Israel, people who are Yire Elohim and Shechaya. And these characteristics, as we just said, really do match up nicely with the root characteristics. And so it is potentially possible that Batsheva is not just writing to her son Shlomo about this woman who he should marry in the abstract, but she's thinking about somebody who really did exist not that long before. We know that Root was Davi Hamelat's great-grandmother, which makes Root Shlomo's great-great-grandmother, and Batsheva's great, um, excuse me, great-grandmother-in-law. Uh, and so she's looking uh, just a little bit in her past towards someone who she feels is worth emulating as an Eshet Chayel, Root Hamoavia. And if we actually think about it a little more deeply, it's not just that Ruth possesses these qualities, but she really did live in a time that was similar to Batsheva, was very dangerous, was strife with war. Um, we know that she lived in the times of the Shoftim, right? Shoftim. That's the opening of Sefer Ruth. And we also know that this was a time of great danger for people, particularly women. As I mentioned before, at the very end of Sefer Shoftim, we know that the, the, that the people advise the men of Binyamin to go into the fields and just pick women who are there. You should just go and you should take these women from the field. And we know that Ruth spent a lot of time in the field. Um, and how that could have been a very dangerous, um, dangerous uh, situation for her. And despite all of this, Ruth really was able to overcome this time period. And she became very respected and very well regarded among her people. 
And I'm sure that Batsheva really saw this and saw this as a real strength of character and a strength of someone who maybe she and other women, or at least the women who her son Shlomo would take, would really emulate to be a true Eshet Chayel. Of course, we know that Ruth is the only woman in Tanakh to be called an Eshet Chayel, and she's called that by her mother-in-law, Naomi, at the end of Sefer Ruth. Ba'atabiti al tiri, my daughter, don't be scared. Kol asher tamri e'eset lach, ki yodea kol sharami ki eshet chayil at. I know that you are truly an eshet chayil. And I hope that as we move into Shavuot and we read Megillah Ruh, we maybe read it with this context, with the context of the eshet chayil, um, and also with this idea that there was someone who came after Ruth who so admired her and who was so impressed by how she was able to act in a time of danger and in a time of war that she not only called her an Aisha Chayel, but perhaps penned an entire poem, an entire song for her using these motifs that were so difficult and plagued her own life, plagued, but plagued Batsheva's life, and that Root was able to overcome. And really, may we all be zocha to see men and women, continue to be zocha to see men and women in this time of war who really, truly are an Chayil in every sense of the word. Um, and I would like to wish everyone a Chag Sameach. Rabbi Kelman, I think I've finished even under time. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Yeshikov, very nice, as always. And we look forward to learning with you, I think, live in Toronto next week, right? Oh, We'll get to see you next good. week. Okay. Was, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think yes. We yes. have some uh, some questions, so I'm happy to take a look. I think there's one comment. I think. Yeah. Take a quick look, yeah, and then okay. we'll get started. Okay. Uh, uh, Gershon. Yeah. I think Gershon. it's. I, I uh, think. I think it's. I think it's when we sing the Eshet Chayil to our wives on Shabbat. Mm -hmm. They're saying they're 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 the opposite of Moaviot who are two. Mm to us. Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, the opposite of Moabia. Okay. Interesting. Even though uh, Ruth was herself a Moabia, she was maybe able to uh, she was able to She was transformed. Transformed. And Ruth passed off that, that Moabite status. In the actual Megillah itself. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, she transforms into the Eshet Chayel. Um, he does not follow his own advice, says Gershon. Right. Yes. I, <laughs> interesting. I do agree. Um, and there's actually some interesting parallels where it's almost that people are giving Shlomo advice to be more like Boaz. And I think there's some interesting parallels or um, motifs that, are, that, that hang between those two characters, Boaz and Shlomo. Um, that are interesting to explore as well, and how he maybe goes on a different path from Boaz and is not Zohar to the Eshet Chayel. So I think that's that's very nice. Okay, um, thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, yeah. We are, you know, okay, we're thinking well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.